Welcome to this compilation of five bleak and brooding science fiction short stories. I'll be narrating Morgue Ship by Ray Bradbury, Exploiter's End by James Causey, Gramp by Charles V. DeVette, Death of a Spaceman by Walter M. Miller Jr., and The Last Gentleman by Rory McGill. If you find yourself enjoying the stories and would like more, consider signing up to my Patreon. There you get exclusive monthly novelettes and half a year's early access to all full novels I narrate, plus ad-free audio and video versions of all stories. Head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff if you're interested. But now, let's get to the stories. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Morgue Ship by Ray Bradbury Narrated by William Skye This was Burnett's last trip. Three more shelves to fill with space-slain warriors, and he would be among the living again. He heard the starport grind open, and the movement of the metal claws groping into space, and then the starport closed. There was another dead man aboard the Constellation. Sam Burnett shook his long head, trying to think clearly. Pallid and quiet, three bodies lay on the cold, transparent tables around him. Machines stirred, revolved, hummed. He didn't see them. He didn't see anything but a red haze over his mind. It blotted out the far wall of the laboratory where the shelves went up and down, numbered in scarlet, keeping the bodies of soldiers from all further harm. Burnett didn't move. He stood there in his rumpled white surgical gown, staring at his fingers gloved in bone-white rubber, feeling all tight and wild inside himself. It went on for days, moving the ship, opening the starport, Extending the retriever claw, plucking some poor warrior's body out of the void. He didn't like it any more. Ten years is too long to go back and forth from Earth to nowhere. You came out empty, and you went back full cargoed with a lot of warriors who didn't laugh or talk or smoke, who just lay on their shelves, all one hundred of them, waiting for a decent burial. Number 98. Coming matter-of-fact and slow, Rice's voice from the ceiling radio hit Burnett. Number 98, Burnett repeated. Working on 95, 96 and 97 now. Blood pumps, preservative, slight surgery. Off a million miles away his voice was talking. It sounded deep. It didn't belong to him anymore. Rice said, Boy oh body, two more pickups and back to New York. Me for a ten day drunk. Burnett peeled the gloves off his huge red soft hands, slapped them into a floor incinerator mouth. Back to Earth, then spin around and shoot right out again in the trail of the war rockets that blasted one another in galactic fury, to sidle up behind gutted wrecks of ships, salvaging any bodies still intact after the conflict. Two men, Rice and himself, sharing a cosy morgue ship with a hundred other men who had forgotten quite suddenly, however, to talk again. Ten years of it. Every hour of those ten years eating like maggots inside, working out to the surface of Burnett's face, working under the husk of his starved eyes and starved limbs. Starved for life. Starved for action. This would be his last trip, or he'd know the reason why. Sam! Burnett jerked. Rice's voice clipped through the drainage preservative lab, bounded against glassite retorts, echoed from the refrigerator shelves. Burnett stared at the tabled bodies as if they would leap to life, even while preservative was being pumped into their veins. Sam, on the double, up the rungs. Burnett closed his eyes and said a couple of words firmly. Nothing was worth running for any more. Another body. There had been one hundred thousand bodies preceding it. Nothing unusual about a body with blood cooling in it. Shaking his head, he walked unsteadily toward the rungs that gleamed up into the airlock control room sector of the rocket. He climbed without making any noise on the rungs. He kept thinking the one thing he couldn't forget. You never catch up with the war. All the colour is ahead of you. The drive of orange rocket traces across stars, the whamming of steel-nosed bombs into elusive targets, the titanic explosions and breathless pursuits, the flags and the excited glory are always a million miles ahead. He bit his teeth together. You never catch up with the war. You come along when space has settled back, when the vacuum has stopped trembling from unleashed forces between worlds. You come along in the dark quiet of death, 
to find the wreckage plunging with all the fury of its original acceleration in no particular direction. You can only see it, you don't hear anything in space but your own heart kicking your ribs. You see bodies, each in its own terrific orbit, given impetus by grinding collisions, tossed from motherships and dancing head over feet forever and forever with no goal. Bits of flesh in ruptured spacesuits, mouths open for air that had never been there in a hundred billion centuries. And they kept dancing without music until you extended the retriever claw and culled them into the airlock. That was all the war glory he got. Nothing but the stunned, shivering silence, the memory of rockets long gone, and the shells filling up all too quickly with men who had once loved laughing. You wondered who all the men were, and who the next ones would be. After ten years you made yourself blind to them. You went around doing your job with mechanical hands. But even a machine breaks down. Sam! Rice turned swiftly as Burnett dragged himself up the ladder. Red and warm, Rice's face hovered over the body of a sprawled enemy official. Take a look at this! Burnett caught his breath. His eyes narrowed. There was something wrong with the body. His experienced glance knew that. He didn't know what it was. Maybe it was because the body looked a little too dead. Burnett didn't say anything, but he climbed the rest of the way, stood quietly in the grey metal airlock. The enemy official was as delicately made as a fine white spider. Eyelids, closed, were faintly blue. The hair was thin silken strands of pale gold, waved and pressed close to a veined skull. Where the thin-lipped mouth fell open, a cluster of needle-tipped teeth glittered. The fragile body was enclosed completely in milk-pale synthesilk, a holstered gun at the middle. Burnett rubbed his jaw. Well? Rice exploded. His eyes were hot and his young, sharp-cut face, hot and black. Good Lord, Sam, do you know who this is? Burnett scowled uneasily and said no. It's Lethler, Rice retorted. Burnett said, Lethler? And then, Oh yes, Kriere's Major Domo, that right? Don't say it calm, Sam. Say it big. Say it big. If Lethler is here in space, then Kriere's not far away from him. Burnett shrugged. More bodies, more people, more war. What the hell? What the hell? He was tired. Talk about bodies and rulers to someone else. Rice grabbed him by the shoulders. Snap out of it, Sam. Think. Kriere, the Almighty, in our territory. His right-hand man dead. That means Kriere was in an accident too. Sam opened his thin lips and the words fell out all by themselves. Look, Rice, you're new at this game. I've been at it ever since the Venus Earth mess started. It's been seesawing back and forth since the day you played hooky in the tenth grade, and I've been in the thick of it. When there's nothing left but seared memories, I'll be prowling through the void, picking up warriors and taking them back to good green earth. Grizzly, yes, but it's routine. As for Kriere, if he's anywhere around, he's smart. Every precaution is taken to protect that one. But Lethler, his body must mean something. And if it does, have we got guns aboard this morgue ship? Are we a battle cruiser to go against him? We'll radio for help. Yeah? If there's a warship within our radio range, 700,000 miles, we'll get it. Unfortunately, the tide of battle has swept out past Earth in a new war concerning Io. That's out, Rice. Rice stood about three inches below Sam Burnett's six-foot-one. Jaw hard and determined, he stared at Sam, a funny light in his eyes. His fingers twitched all by themselves at his sides. His mouth twisted. You're one hell of a patriot, Sam Burnett! Burnett reached out with one long finger tapped it quietly on Rice's barrel chest. Haul a cargo of corpses for three thousand nights and days and see how patriotic you feel. All those fine muscled lads bloated and crushed by space pressures and heat blasts. Fine lads who start out smiling and get the smile burned off down to the bone. Burnett swallowed and didn't say anything more, but he closed his eyes. He stood there smelling the death odour in the hot air of the ship, hearing the chug 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 of the blood pumps down below and his own heart waiting warm and heavy at the base of his throat. This is my last cargo, Rice. I can't take it any longer. And I don't care how much I go back to Earth. This Venusian here, what's his name? Lethler. He's number 98. Shove me into shelf 99 beside him and get the hell home. That's how I feel. Rice was going to say something, but he didn't have time. Lethler was alive. He rose from the floor with slow, easy movements, almost like a dream. He didn't say anything. 
the heat blast in his white fingers did all the necessary talking. It didn't say anything either, but Burnett knew what language it would use if it had to. Burnett swallowed hard. The body had looked funny. Too dead. Now he knew why. Involuntarily, Burnett moved forward. Lethler moved like a pale spider, flicking his fragile arm to cover Burnett, the gun in it like a dead, cold star. Rice sucked in his breath. Burnett forced himself to take it easy. From the corners of his eyes he saw Rice's expression go deep and tight, biting lines into his sharp face. Rice got it out finally. "'How'd you do it?' he demanded bitterly. "'How'd you live in the void? It's impossible!' A crazy thought came ramming down and exploded in Burnett's head. "'You never catch up with the war. But what if the war catches up with you? What in hell would Lethler be wanting aboard a morgue ship?' Lethler half crouched in the midst of the smell of death and the chugging of blood pumps below. In the silence he reached up with quick fingers, tapped a tiny crystal stud upon the back of his head, and the halves of a microscopically thin chrysalis parted transparently off of his face. He shucked it off, trailing air tendrils that had been inserted, hidden in the uniform, ending in thin globules of oxygen. He spoke. Triumph warmed his crystal-thin voice. "'That's how I did it, Earthman!' "'Glassite!' said Rice. "'A face-moulded mask of glassite!' Lethler nodded. His milk-blue eyes dilated. Very marvellously paired to an unbreakable thickness of one thirtieth of an inch, worn only on the head. You have to look quickly to notice it, and unfortunately, viewed as you saw it outside the ship floating in the void, not discernible at all. Prickles of sweat appeared on Rice's face. He swore at the Venusian, and the Venusian laughed like some sort of stringed instrument, high and quick. Burnett laughed too, ironically. First time in years a man ever came aboard the Constellation alive. It's a welcome change. Lethler showed his needle-like teeth. I thought it might be. Where's your radio? Go find it, snapped Rice hotly. I will. One hand, blue-veined on the ladder rungs, Lethler paused. I know you're weaponless. Purple cross regulations. And this airlock is safe. Don't move. Whispering, his naked feet padded white up the ladder. Two long breaths later, something crashed. Metal and glass and coils. The radio. Burnett put his shoulder blades against the wall metal, looking at his feet. When he glanced up, Rice's fresh, animated face was spoiled by the new bitterness in it. Lethler came down, like a breath of air on the rungs. He smiled. That's better. Now. We can talk. Rice said it slow. Interplanetary law declares it straight, Lethler. Get out. Only dead men belong here. Lethler's gun grip tightened. More talk of that nature, and only dead men there will be he blinked. But first, we must rescue Crier. Crier! Rice acted as if he had been hit in the jaw. Burnett moved his tongue back and forth on his lips silently, his eyes lidded, listening to the two of them as if they were a radio drama. Lethler's voice came next. Rather unfortunately, yes. He's still alive, heading toward Venus at an orbital velocity of two thousand miles per hour, wearing one of these air chrysali. Enough air for two more hours. Our flagship was attacked unexpectedly yesterday near Mars. We were forced to take the lifeboats, scattering, Crier and I in one, the others sacrificing their lives to cover our escape. We were lucky. We got through the Earth cordon unseen. But luck can't last forever. We saw your morgue ship an hour ago. It's a long, long way to Venus. We were running out of fuel, food, water. Radio was broken. Capture was certain. You were coming our way. We took the chance. We set a small time bomb to destroy the life rocket and cast off, wearing our chrysalis helmets. It was the first time we had ever tried using them to trick anyone. We knew you wouldn't know we were alive until it was too late and we controlled your ship. We knew you picked up all bodies for brief exams, returning alien corpses to space later. Rice's voice was sullen. A setup for you, huh? Travelling under the protection of the Purple Cross, you can get your damned almighty safe to Venus. Lethler bowed slightly. Who would suspect a morgue rocket of providing safe hiding for precious Venusian cargo? Precious is the word for you, brother, said Rice. Enough, Lethler moved his gun several inches. Accelerate toward Venus, motor detectors wide open. Crier must be picked up, now. Rice didn't move. Burnett moved first, feeling alive for the first time in years. Sure, said Sam, smiling. We'll pick him up. No tricks, said Lethler. Burnett scowled and smiled together. No tricks. You'll have Crier on board the Constellation in half an hour, or I'm no coroner. 
Follow me up the ladder. Lethler danced up, turned, waved his gun. Come on. Burnett went up, quick, almost as if he enjoyed doing Lethler a favour. Rice grumbled and cursed after him. On the way up, Burnett thought about it, about Lethler poised like a white feather at the top, holding death in his hand. You never knew whose body would come in through the starport next. Number 98 was Lethler. Number 99 would be Creer. There were two shelves numbered and empty. They should be filled. And what more proper than that Creer and Lethler should fill them? But, he chewed his lip, that would need a bit of doing. And even then the cargo wouldn't be full. Still one more body to get. One hundred. And you never knew who it would be. He came out of the quick thoughts when he looped his long leg over the whole rim, stepped up, faced Lethler in a cramped control room that was one glittering swirl of silver levers, audio plates and visuals. Chronometers clicking told of the steady dropping toward the sun at a slow pace. Burnett set his teeth together, bone against bone. Help Creer escape? See him safely to Venus and then be freed? Sounded easy, wouldn't be hard. Venusians weren't blind with malice. Rice and he could come out alive if they cooperated. But there were a lot of warriors sleeping on a lot of numbered shelves in the dim corridors of the long years, and their dead lips were stirring to life in Burnett's ears. Not so easily could they be ignored. You may never catch up with the war again. The last trip. Yes, this could be it. Capture Creer and end the war. But what ridiculous fantasy was it made him believe he could actually do it? Two muscles moved on Burnett, one in each long cheek. The sag in his body vanished as he tautened his spine, flexed his lean sinewed arms, wet thin lips. Now, where do you want this crate? he asked Lethler easily. Lethler exhaled softly. Cooperation. I like it. You're wise, Earthman. Very, said Burnett. He was thinking about three thousand eternal nights of young bodies being ripped, slaughtered, flung to the vacuum tides. Ten years of hating a job and hoping that some day there would be a last trip and it would all be over. Burnett laughed through his nose. Controls moved under his fingers like fluid, loved, caressed, tended by his familiar touching. Looking ahead, he squinted. There's your ruler now, Lethler, doing somersaults. Looks dead. A good trick. Cut power! We don't want to burn him! Burnett cut. Creer's milky face floated dreamily into a visual screen, eyes sealed, lips gaping, hands sagging, clutching emptily at the stars. We're about fifty miles from him, catching up. Burnett turned to Lethler with an intent scowl. Funny. This was the first and the last time anybody would ever board the constellation alive. His stomach went flat, tautened with sudden weakening fear. If Creer could be captured, that meant the end of the war, the end of shelves stacked with sleeping warriors, the end of this blind searching. Creer then had to be taken aboard. After that... Creer, the Almighty at whose behest all space had quivered like a smitten gong for part of a century. Creer, revolving in his neat water-blue uniform, emblem shining gold, heat gun tucked in glossy jet holster. With Creer aboard, chances of overcoming him would be eliminated. Now, Rice and Burnett against Lethler. Lethler favoured because of his gun. Creer would make odds impossible. Something had to be done before Creer came in. Lethler had to be yanked off guard, shocked, bewildered, fooled somehow. But how? Burnett's jaw froze tight. He could feel a spot on his shoulder blade where Lethler would send a bullet crashing into rib, sinew, artery, heart. There was a way, and there was a weapon. And the war would be over, and this would be the last trip. Sweat covered his palms in a nervous smear. Steady, Rice, he said matter-of-factly. With the rockets cut, there was too much silence, and his voice sounded guilty, standing up alone in the centre of that silence. Take controls, Rice. I'll manipulate the starport. Burnett slipped from the control console. Rice replaced him grimly. Burnett strode to the next console of levers. That spot on his back kept aching like it was sear branded X. For the place where the bullet sings and rips. And if you turn quick, catching it in the arm first, why? Creer loomed bigger, a white spider delicately dancing on a web of stars. His eyes flicked open behind the glassite sheath and saw the constellation. Creer smiled. His hands came up. He knew he was about to be rescued. Burnett smiled right back at him. What Creer didn't know was that he was about to end a ten years' war. There was only one way of drawing Lethler off guard, and it had to be fast. Burnett jabbed a purple-topped stud. 
The starport clashed open as it had done a thousand times before, but for the first time it was a good sound. And out of the starport, at Sam Burnett's easily fingered directions, slid the long claw-like mechanism that picked up bodies from space. Lethla watched, intent and cold and quiet. The gun was cold and quiet, too. The claw glided toward Creer without a sound now, dreamlike in its slowness. It reached Creer. Burnett inhaled a deep breath. The metal claw cuddled Creer in its shiny palm. Lethla watched. He watched while Burnett exhaled, touched another lever, and said, You know, Lethla, there's an old saying that only dead men come aboard the constellation. I believe it. And the claw closed as Burnett spoke, closed slowly and certainly, all around Creer, crushing him into a ridiculous posture of silence. There was blood running on the claw, and the only recognisable part was the head, which was carefully preserved for identification. That was the only way to draw Lethla off guard. Burnett spun about and leaped. The horror on Lethla's face didn't go away as he fired his gun. Bryce came in fighting too, but not before something like a red-hot ramrod stabbed Sam Burnett, catching him in the ribs, spinning him back like a drunken idiot to fall in a corner. Fists made blunt flesh noises. Lethla went down, weaponless and screaming. Rice kicked. After a while, Lethla quit screaming, and the room swam around in Burnett's eyes, and he closed them tight and started laughing. He didn't finish laughing for maybe ten minutes. He heard the retriever claws come inside and the starport grind shut. Out of the red darkness, Rice's voice came, and then he could see Rice's young face over him. Burnett groaned. Rice said, Sam, you shouldn't have done it. You shouldn't have, Sam. To hell with it. Burnett winced and fought to keep his eyes open. Something wet and sticky covered his chest. I said this was my last trip, and I meant it. One way or the other, I'd have quit. This is the hard way. Maybe. I don't know. Kind of nice to think of all those kids who'll never have to come aboard the Constellation, though, Rice. His voice trailed off. You watch the shelves fill up, and you never know who'll be next. Who'd have thought, four days ago? Something happened to his tongue, so it felt like hard ice blocking his mouth. He had a lot more words to say, but only time to get a few of them out. Rice? Yes, yeah, Sam? We haven't got a full cargo, boy. Full enough for me, sir. But still not full. If we went back to center base without filling the shelves, it wouldn't be right. Look there. Number 98 is Lethla. Number 99 is Creer. Three thousand days of rolling this rocket and not once come back without a bunch of the kids who want to sleep easy on the good green earth. Not right to be going back anyway, but the way we used to... His voice got all full of fog, as thick as the fists of a dozen warriors. Rice was going away from him. Rice was standing still, and Burnett was lying down, not moving, but somehow Rice was going away a million miles. Ain't I one hell of a patriot, Rice? Then everything got dark except Rice's face, and that was starting to dissolve. Ninety-eight Lethla, ninety-nine Creer. He could still see Rice standing over him for a long time, breathing out and in. Down under the tables the blood pumps pulsed and pulsed, thick and slow. Rice looked down at Burnet and then at the empty shelf at the far end of the room, and then back at Burnet again. And then he said softly, One hundred. Exploiter's End by James Causey Narrated by William Skye People or termites, it's all the same. There's a limit to how far you can drive them. We time-studied the term. It moved with a pliant, liquid grace, its forearms flickering over the instrument panel, installing studs, tightening screws, its antennae glowing with the lambent yellow that denoted an agony of effort. See? Harvey's freckled face was smug. He rates an easy 110. Whoever took that first study? I took it, I said, squinting at the stopwatch. You could hear him bite his lip. After only two weeks on the job on a strange planet, ninety light years from home, you don't tell your boss he's cockeyed. The term hurried. Its faceted termite eyes were expressionless diamonds, but the antennae gleamed a desperate saffron. If bugs could sweat, I thought wryly. Now the quartz panel installation. Those forearms moved in a blinding frenzy. But the stopwatch was faster. 
the second hand caught up with the turn. It passed him. Rating 74%. I tucked the clipboard under my arm, squeezed through the airlock and down the ramp. Harvey followed sullenly. The conveyor groaned on, bringing up the next unit, a sleek little cruiser. The term seized a fifty-pound air wrench, fled up the ramp to the airlock. A dozen feet back to the operation, I pointed out. After the next job, he'll have to return forty feet, then sixty. He's in the hole. Harvey looked at his shoes. John Barry, the trim superintendent, came puffing down the line, his jowled face anxious about direct labour cost, the way every good super should be. Anything wrong, Jake? He can't cut it, I said. Barry frowned up through the airlock at the term. Those antennae now shone the soft, sad purple of despair. We walked past the body jigs. The air was a haze of blue smoke, punctuated with yellow splashes of flame from the electronic welding guns. Terms scuttled like gigantic spiders over the great silver hulls, their antennae glowing in a pattern of swift bright harmony, right on standard, good cost. Harvey's face was rapt as he watched them. I said harshly, Give me your third production axiom. Harvey's shoulders squared. He said stiffly, Beauty is functional. The quintessence of grace is the clean, soaring beauty of a spaceship's hull. Extrapolate, Harvey. His lips were tight. What I see is ugly. Terms must be taught individuality. What I see is a fascinating, deadly beauty. Deadly because it's useless. We must sublimate it, grind it down, hammer it out into a useful pattern. Waste motion is a sin. Excellent. We turned into the administration lift, leaving the iron roar behind us, and on the way up Harvey didn't say a word. I listened for the tinkle of shattering ideals, and said patiently, You're here to build spaceships, to build them better and cheaper than consolidated or solar. Hell, we've even set up a village for the terms. Electricity, plumbing, luxuries they wouldn't normally enjoy for the next million years. Will they fire him? Harvey's voice was flat. My temper was shredding. Four-day layoff, his third this month. Terms kick in most of their salary for village maintenance. They can't afford a part-time producer. I could see that term read out of the gang, leaving the company village stoically, while his fellows played a wailing dirge of colour on their antennae. The farewell song. I could see him trudging over the windswept peak of Cobalt Mountain, staring down at his native village, and shaking with the impact of the Stammverstand, the tribe mind, the ache and the longing. A wheel, shaken out of orbit, the lonely cog searching for its lost slot. I could see that term returning to his tribe, and how they'd tear him to pieces because he was a thing apart now, an alien. We walked down the grey corridor, past Syke, past the conference hall, to the silver door marked Methods and Standards. Harvey's blue eyes were remote, stubborn. I clapped him paternally on the shoulder. Anyone can call one wrong, lad. Forget it. Harvey slumped down at a computer, and I walked into my private office and shut the door. Harvey's personal dossier was at my desk. IQ, 178. Fair. Stability quotient, 2.8. Very bad. Adaptability rating, 0.7. Borderline. Those idiots in psych. Couldn't they indoctrinate a new man properly? I waited. In a moment, Harvey came in without knocking and said, Mr. Egan, I want to quit. I took my time lighting a cigar, not raising my head. His defiant, pleading look. I blew smoke rings at the Visicom and finally said, Since you were sixteen you've dreamed of this. Elimination tests, the weeding out, ten thousand other smart, hungry kids fighting you for this job. I tasted the words. When your contract's up, you can write your own ticket anywhere in the system. He blurted. I came here full of ideas about the wonderful work Amalgamated was doing to advance backward civilizations. Sure, the terms have a union. They're paid at standard galactic rates for spacecraft assembly. But you make them live in that village. It costs to run that village. You give it to them with one hand and take it back with the other. All the time you're holding out the promise of racial advancement, individuality. Some day the terms will reach the stars. Nuts. That's guild propaganda, I said softly. The guild is just a bogey you created to keep the intersolar spacecrafters union in line. There's a Venusport liner due in next week. When it leaves, I'll be on it. I played Dutch uncle. I told him he wasn't used to Terminorb's one and a half gravs, that this was just a hangover from the three to five oxygen ratio he wasn't used to. But he said no. Finally, I shrugged, scribbled something on an AVO and handed it to him. All right, Harvey, I said mildly. Take this down to Carmody and Psyche. He'll give you a clearance. Harvey's face went white. Since when do you go to Psyche for a clearance? 
I pressed a stud under the desk and two analysts came in. I told them what to do, and Harvey screamed. He fought and bit and clawed. He mouthed unutterable things about what we were doing to the terms until I chopped him mercifully behind the ear. "'Poor devil!' panted one of the analysts. "'Obviously insufficient indoctrination, sir. Would you mind if I spent an hour in psych for reorientation? He... he upset me.' My eyes stung with pride. Sam had loyalty plus. "'Sure thing, Sam. You'd better go too, Barney. He said some pretty ugly things.' They dragged Harvey out and I went over to the Visicom, punched a button. I was trembling with an icy rage as Carmody's lean hawk face swam into view. "'Hello, Jake,' he said languidly. "'How's cost?' I told him curtly about Harvey. "'Another weak sister,' I rasped. "'Can't you screen them any more? Didn't you note his stability index? I'm going to report this to Starza, Don.' "'Relax,' Carmody smiled. "'Those things happen, Jake.' We'll do a few gentle things with scalpel and narcosynthesis, and he'll be back in a week, real eager, the perfect cost analyst. I'd never liked Carmody. He was so smug, he didn't realise the sacredness of his position. I said coldly, Put Miss Davis on. Carmody's grin was knowing. The screen flickered, and Fern's face came into focus. Her moist red lips parted, and I shivered looking at her, even on a Visicom screen. The shining glory of her hair, those cool green eyes... Three months hadn't made a difference. How was little old Earth? I said awkwardly. Wonderful, she was radiant. I'll see you for lunch. Today's grievance day. Dinner? I promised Don, she said demurely. I swallowed hard. How about the term festival tomorrow night? Well, Don sort of asked. I tried to laugh it off and Fern said she'd see me later and the screen went blank and I sat there, shaking. The screen flickered again. Starza's great moon face smiled at me and said sweetly, we're ready to start grieving. I picked up the time studies that were death sentences for two terms, and went down the hall to Ulcer Gulch, the conference room. Lure a termite away from his tribe. Promise him the stars. Make him bust his thorax on an assembly line. He makes a wonderful worker, with reflexes twice as fast as a human's, but he still isn't an individual. Even when putting a spaceship together he's still part of the tribe, part of a glowing symphony of colour and motion. That's bad for production. Accent on individuality, that was the keynote. The terms and their union representatives could argue a grievance right to the letter of the contract, but when it came to production standards, we had them. Terminorb 4 was 90 light years from the system, and the terms couldn't afford a home office time and motion analyst. It wasn't worth it. Terms were expendable. Lost Tichnat was committee men at large for the term local. He sat regally at the head of the conference table, seven gleaming chitinous feet of him with his softly pulsating antennae and faceted eyes, and said in a clicking, humorless voice, The first item is a second-stage grievance. Brother Nadkek, in final assembly, was laid off for one day. Reason? He missed an operation. The grievance, of course, is a mere formality. You will deny it. Dave Stalza winked at me from behind horn-rimmed glasses. He sat like some great bland Buddha, director of industrial relations, genius in outer psychology, Ruthless, soft-spoken, anticipator of alien trends. He said in that beautiful velvet voice, Ordinarily, yes. In this case, Nadkek wished to ask his foreman about omitting a welding phase of the operation. While the suggestion was declined, Nadkek showed unmistakable initiative. Starza stressed the word. We appreciate his interest in the job. He will receive pay for the lost day. Around the table, Antenny flashed amazed colours. A precedent had been set. Interest in the job transcended even the contract. Management sustains the grievance, Tichnat droned incredulously. Of course, Starza said. Nadkek left the conference room, his antennae a puzzled mauve. Next, Starza said pontifically. The next grievance was simply that a foreman had spoken harshly to a term. The term resented it. In his tribe he had been a fighter, prime guardian of the Queen Mother. Fighters could not be reprimanded as could spinners or workers. Starza and Tichnut split hairs while I dozed and thought about Fern. Starza finally promised to reprimand the foreman. It was lovely the way he thumped on the table, aflame with righteousness, his voice golden thunder, the martyr hurt by Tichnut's unfairness, yet so eager to compromise, to be fair. The next grievance was work standards. Starza looked at me. This one mattered. This was cost. I pulled out my study proofs, said, Radnor in final assembly, consistently in the whole, Rating 74%. The operation was too tight, Jake. Admit it. The thought uncoiled darkly, thundering and reverberating in the horrified caverns of my brain. 
a thoughtcaster. So the guild had thoughtcasters now. The guild had finally come. I sat in the dank silence, shaking. A drop of ice crawled slowly down my temple. I stared around the conference table at Starza's frown, at those term faces, the great faceted eyes. We gave this worker every chance, I said, licking my lips. We put him on another operation. He still couldn't cut it. Even though we've got production to meet, we still give as many chances. The thought slashed. It grew into a soundless roar. Stop it, Jake! Tell them how Amalgamated Under the Cloak of Liberation is strangling the turns with an alien culture. Tell them what a mockery their contract really is. Tell them about that term you condemned this morning. I fought it. Feeling the blood run from my lip, I fought it. I'd seen strong men driven insane by a thoughtcaster within seconds. My stability index was 6.3. Damned high. I fought it. I got to my feet. The room reeled. Those damned term faces. The shining antennae. I stumbled towards the door. The thought became a whiplash of molten fury. Uphold that grievance, Jake. Tell them the truth. Admit the standard was impossible to meet. I slammed the door. The voice stopped. My skull was a shattered flywheel, a sunburst of agony. I was retching. I stumbled down the corridor to Psyche. Fern was there. I was screaming at her. The guild was here. They had thoughtcasters. My brain was melting. Fern was white-faced. She had a hypo. I didn't feel it. The last thing I saw was the glimmer of tears in her green eyes. The Neuron Flow Starza's voice No two alike, like fingerprints. What a pity they can't refine the transmittal waves. I tried to open my eyes. The Guild atomized Solar's plant on Proicon, Carmody's voice said quietly. It's just a question of time, Dave. No, Starza said thoughtfully. Proicon was a sweatshop. I think maybe they're hinting that our production standards are a trifle rough. Look, his eyelids fluttered. Bet you he takes refuge in amnesia. You lose. My voice was an iron groan. We were in Starza's office. Carmody peered at me with a clinical eye. I took the liberty of narcosynthesis while you were out, Jake. You told us all about it. How do you feel? I told them how I felt in spades. I want my vacation now, I said. I've accrued seven months. I'm going to Venus, I said. Now, now, Starza said. Mustn't desert the sinking ship, Jake. I shut my eyes. His voice was soothing oil. Jake, the Guild as a whole doesn't know of this plant. Guild agents are freelancers, in the full sense of the word. They exercise their own initiative, and only report to Guild HQ when the job is done. Then, Carmody said, if we can find out who... Precisely. Starza's eyes were veiled. Incidentally, Don, you've been gone the last four days. Why? Carmody regarded him steadily. Recruiting. You knew that. Yet you brought back only a dozen terms. Carmody drew a slow, deep breath. Word's gotten around, Dave. The tribes have finally forgotten their petty wars and united against a common enemy. Us. Any term that exhibits undesirable traits of individuality is now destroyed. I think a dozen was a good haul. You had the whole planet. Carmody's grin was diamond hard. You think maybe I spent a few hours under a guild mind control? Is that it? Starza said, On your way out, send lost Tichnat in. Carmody flushed. Tichnat's the one and you know it. But if he's not, if you haven't run down the spy by tomorrow, you can accept my resignation. I saw what they left of Proicon. The door slammed behind him. Starza smiled at me. What do you think, Jake? Tichnat. The second I got out of there, the thoughtcaster stopped. Doesn't mean a thing. They can beam through solid rock, hundred foot radius. No exploitation, I mused. Fanatics, Starza said. They'd impede the progress of man, sacrifice man's rightful place in the cosmos for the sake of crawling things. We'll fight them, Jake. Tichinat entered. He stood stiffly before Starza's desk, his antennae a cheerful emerald. Starza said carefully, What do you know about the guild? Impractical visionaries, Tichinat clicked. Lovers of stasis, well-meaning fools. They approached me yesterday. A vein throbbed purple in Starza's forehead, yet he kept his voice soft. And you didn't report it? And precipitate a crisis? Tichnut sounded amused. I was asked if my people were being persecuted. Had I answered in the affirmative, there might have been repercussions, perhaps a sequel to Proicon. Oh yes, we know of Proicon. Your foremen are sometimes indiscreet. Who was the agent? Starza breathed. Should I tell you and disrupt the status quo? You would destroy the agent. In retaliation, the guild might destroy this plant. 
Impossible. Guild agents have no such authority. A chance I cannot afford to take, Tichnat was adamant. Amalgamated, Starza prodded, offers a standing reward of 100,000 solar credits for apprehension of any guild agent. Your village could use those credits. You could equip an atomic lab. You could maintain your own research staff. Stop it, the antennae throbbed brilliantly. We are your friends, Tichnat. Symbiosis, I believe is the word, Tichnat clicked dryly. You need us. We need your science. We need your terrifying concept of individuality. We need to lose our old ways. The dance of harvest time, the Queen Mother. One by one the rituals drop away. The old life, the good tribal life is dying. You sift out us misfits who chafe at tribal oneness. You offer us the planets. The antennae flashed an angry scarlet. You think to keep us chained a millennium. A hundred years will suffice. We will leave you. We exiles you have made, we who would be destroyed if we dared return to the tribe, we shall rule this world. You aliens drive a hard bargain, but the dream is worth it. Prometheus in a bug's body. The shining strength and the dark, terrible pride. It is no dream, Starza said gently. But perhaps you go about achieving it the wrong way. You still refuse to divulge the spy? I am sorry. Good day. Starza brooded after him. He's a fool. But he's grasping mankind's concepts, Jake. I'd give my right eye for a good semanticist. Basic English does it. Self, want, mine, selfish ego words, the cornerstones of grasping humanity. Sure, we'll raise hell with their aesthetic sense, but in the end they'll thank us. I sat worrying about a secret fanatic somewhere in the plant who, in the holy interests of Mars for the Martians, Terminorb for the Terms, might soon plant an atomic warhead in our body shop. I finally said, what are we going to do? Do? Starsa chuckled. Why, slacken line speeds, lower production standards, 50% at least. By tomorrow we'll be down to 40 jobs an hour. They want loose standards, we'll give it to them. But my cost? Obscenity your cost. Look, Jake, no matter how you set an operation up, the terms manage to work in some glittering little ritual. They have to create beauty. Their aesthetic sense must be fed. They can't adjust to quick change. Supposing you cut line speeds by 10%. They adjust, but it almost kills them. Then drop 30%. Their ritual loses timing, becomes discordant. What happens? I blinked. They go mad. And our little guild saboteur will be guilty of a few term deaths. He'll have violated a basic guild tenet. He'll go home with his tail between his legs. Catch? I caught. By mid-afternoon we had the conveyor speeds down 30%. The red line on my cost chart soared precariously. The entire production line slowed to a crawl. We waited. At five o'clock it happened. Three terms in the body shop went mad. It started a chain reaction through the trim line. Six more terms ran amuck and had to be destroyed. Final assembly became a shambles. Starza called me on the visicom, delighted. Our guild agent played right into our hands, Jake. Enforcing a production slump, he's harming the workers. His next move will probably be a bluff. I wasn't so sure. That evening, the executive dining room was choked with a tight, gnawing tension. Department heads spoke in hushed whispers, eyes darting. The man across the table could be a mindless controlled, a guild pawn. Smile at him politely and keep your mouth shut. I ordered Thar, a terminorb arthropod that was usually more delicious than Venusian lobster, but tonight it tasted like broiled leather. It was like eating in a morgue. I saw Carmody at the next table. I nodded coolly to him, and he hitched his chair over and said, By the way, Jake, I'm sorry about Harvey. He's going back to Earth next week. Why? His stability index was too low, Carmody said smoothly. Sure, we could have given him the works, but you didn't want a robot. I said deliberately. I needed that boy, Don. Carmody got up, his smile infinitely contemptuous. We don't all have your stability index, Jake. I stared after him, and the thought suddenly struck me that not once had I considered quitting, ever. Somehow the thought disturbed me. Abruptly the public address speaker boomed. Attention, Starza's voice crackled. To the guild agent, wherever he may be, today you murdered thirty-seven terms. Is this your altruism? Is this your vaunted justice? He went on, his voice like organ musing, sweeping away all doubt, making you proud and glad to be a part of Algamated, part of production, when quite suddenly his voice choked off. Simultaneously another voice ripped through the hall, a cold ironic whisper lashing at the mind. Altruism, yes, but not as you conceive it. Today you passed your own judgment. 
You have twenty-four hours to evacuate before this plant is destroyed. The verdict is final. The dining hall echoed with moans. Hands leaned to agonized temples. The thoughtcaster again, on a wide-band frequency. Through the pain I was conscious of Stars' voice. The guild was trying to bluff us. We wouldn't let them. I stumbled out of the hall, my teeth chattering, took the lift down to the first level and got outside to walk free in the park. Here was Eden. Giant conifers and ferns wove a cool green pattern of delight, and the laughter of the crystal fountains soothed. Terms had fashioned this garden, had created a poem in living green, a quiet fugue of oneness, each leaf blending exquisitely with the next, the unity, the perfect whole. For one weak moment I let the pattern seep insidiously into me, and then, ashamed, focused my eyes on that jarring splash of white in the centre of the garden. The ten-foot model of the amalgamated X-3M, squat with power, lifting on her stern jets. A symbol of amalgamated strength, the indomitable spirit of mankind, beauty born of pure utility. Oddly, a half-remembered poem of the ancients flitted through my brain. Dirty British coaster with her salt-caked smokestack, butting through the channel on the mad March days. That was man. On an infinity of planets he had met resistance through force, through guile, even through beauty, and he had conquered. I drew a slow, deep breath and sat on one of the benches, staring up at the gigantic horseshoe of the factory, hearing the muted hum of the atomics. Twenty-four hours. I tried to run through my axioms, and I was suddenly terrified. I couldn't remember them. That damned thoughtcaster. Twice in one day. Perhaps there was some gradual neural disintegration. My head hurt terribly. Tomorrow I'd go to Psyche for a checkup. I thought about that marble villa in Venusport, and about my bank account. Not enough. Another year, just one more year, and I could retire, at thirty-four. I thought about the Venusian twilights and the turquoise mists off the deeps, and wondered dully if I'd ever see Venus or the Earth again. I saw Fern walking among the conifers, her face a pale mask of strain. You heard it, Jake? I nodded. We sat in the aquamarine twilight, and Fern was shivering, and I put my arm around her. Looks like altruism is a relative thing, I said. What do they want? Uncontaminated terms, she said bitterly. No science, no stars, no wars, and no progress. A big beautiful planet mind, the term mind, forever static, forever dead. It's a bluff, I said. Our little fanatic stalling for time, hoping to stampede us while he finds another way. For example? Why do you think we insist on basic English for all terms? Supposing a foreman should start jabbering Terminese during an operation. The terms would revert. We'd have a line shut down. They can't adjust. Say, a random thought was nibbling at my brain. Where was Carmody this morning? Just before I reeled in. Her fine brows knitted. Why, he went... Oh, Jake, surely you don't think... Went where? Down the hall, towards personnel. Towards the conference hall, you mean? He never even examined Harvey. It wasn't necessary, she said uncomfortably. Don just wanted to verify his stability index. Sure, so he stood outside the conference hall and put a whammy on me. Fern was smiling. I scowled. It fits. It has to be him. Or Tichnat, she said. Or Staza. Or me. I stared at her. You'd do, my voice shook. You were gone three months. They could have got to you. Her rich, warm laughter sifted through the twilight, and I wanted to hit her. They did, she gurgled. But I've decided to relent, Jake. I'll spare the plant on one condition, that you take me to the term festival tomorrow night. I grunted. Carmody working overtime, I suppose. If the plant's still standing. I changed the subject. Two hours later, Starza called a council of war. The conference room was crammed with quivering executives. Starza carefully let the tension build to a shrill crescendo before he said, One of you gentlemen is a guild mindless controlled. Ragged silence. Starza's smile was very faint. You gave us an ultimatum, but destroying this plant is an admission of failure you're not willing to make, yet. You'll try another tack. You're just beginning to discover that this environment we've created for the terms is superior to the primitive jungle. Tichnat! Tichnat stepped forward. His antennae were a proud, brilliant gold. Do you want to shut down? Starza asked softly. Are we fools? Tichnat clicked. To lose what we've gained? To return to our tribe? To be destroyed? Starza's calm gaze caressed each face, probing. You see? Stalemate. Whoever you are, you're bluffing. Tomorrow our conveyor speeds return to normal. 
You'll do nothing. You may try to agitate the terms, but they're satisfied. One of the superintendents cleared his throat. Look, he said unsteadily. Sometimes you can't afford to call a bluff, Starza said pleasantly. Any resignations will be accepted right now. You can wait safely in the term village until next week's freighter arrives. No repercussions, I promise. The lie was blatant. Carmody stood by the door, his smile strained. It was all too obvious what would happen to any resignees. None? Starza's brows rose. I'm proud of you. That's it, gentlemen. The next day was a frenetic nightmare. My cost dropped, but it didn't matter. That was one day when the best company man became a clock watcher. Line foremen, department heads cracked under the strain, and were summarily removed to psych. Carmody and staff worked overtime. I toiled feverishly over operation schedules, the crazily fluctuating cost charts. My headache was gone, but I still couldn't remember my axioms. I felt guilty over not going to psych, but there just wasn't the time. Hell, I'd never needed indoctrination. I was an amalgamated man through and through. Finally, I grabbed an engineering manual, leafed angrily through it, and sat there, empty and shaking. I'd gone insane. The words were gibberish. Oh, I could read them all right, but they didn't make sense. What a filthy trick. Semantic block, Starza would call it. I kept staring at the meaningless words, conscious of a tearing sense of loss. And I wanted to cry. Six o'clock was zero hour. Six o'clock came, and the factory held its collective breath while nothing happened. At 6.30, Starza made a long speech over the public address, about the selfless spirit of man helping the terms reach the stars, about how we would never admit defeat, and about how, after tonight, the term festival would be discontinued. The terms had adopted mankind's culture. They had no further need of their effete native customs. At seven, Fern and I were walking past administration toward the lighted square mile enclosure of the term village. Fern had never seen a festival. A throwback, I said, to their old tribal days. Their harvest, when they pay tribute to the Queen Mother and pray for good crops and work well done. It's their yearly substitute for Stammverstand. Back in the native villages, whenever a term's in trouble, he goes to the council hut and the others join him in a silent group telepathy. But we've just about weaned them, Angel. They'll be individuals soon. We walked down the deserted row of term huts, past the council hall, to the great stone amphitheatre, and sat with the other execs. Fern was very gay and cheerful, but I kept thinking about my axioms, trying to bring them back to life. I felt dead, all dead inside. Starza came up, frowning, and I congratulated him. It's too pat, Jake. It worries me. Where's Carmody? Setting up those semantic reaction tests you gave him, Fern said. But I never gave him... Abruptly, the lights snuffed out. At one end of the arena loomed a twelve-foot statue of a bloated term, limbed in a soft pale glow. The Queen Mother. The hush. Then the radiance. Slowly, the terms filed into the arena, rank upon rank of living flame. First, the fighters, their antennae shining crimson and splendid against the tall night. Then the twin glows of blue that denoted the spinners, the weavers. The golden blaze of the harvesters. The lambent colours crept through the air like a mood, like a dream, and deepened into a shimmering cataract of rainbow fire, a paean of light and glory that whirled and spun in a joyous rhythm as old as the race itself. Then, chaos. A blinding flare cascaded from the six-foot antennae of the statue. The radiance grew, brighter than an atomic flare, more terrible than the sun. The term stood frozen. Beside me, Starza swore. This wasn't in the script. That colossal voice. Ear-snapping clicks and liquid vowels, terminees, the forbidden tongue. The voice blared. I caught most of it. Children, you have sinned. You are defiled with the taint of alien monsters. You have failed the Queen Mother. Return, my children. Return to your tribes. Return to the tabernacle of unity, the one in all, the Queen Mother. For in death there is life and there is joy in immolation. Return. Lastly, the climax that last shattering hunk of propaganda that would have been so tritely amusing if it hadn't been so terrifying. You have nothing to lose but your chains. The giant antennae faded into a liquid silver, the silver of hope, of forgiveness. For a moment I was blind. I felt fern trembling against me. The execs were chattering like frightened sheep. Then I could see. I saw Starza. He was moving down the aisle, cursing in a tight, dull monotone. I followed him down into the arena. The terms stood shriveled, mute. 
Starzer was fumbling at the base of the statue, and he said in a thick, horrible voice, Look! The loudspeaker. The coiled wiring. The terms stirred. Starzer leaped to the lap of the statue. He bawled, Listen! This is sacrilege! You have been victims of a hoax! Not listening, they filed in silent groups out of the arena. Their antennae were the colour of ashes. Starzer jumped down. He pounded after them. He was shouting at lost Tichnat. I know, Tichnat droned. He kept walking. You are right. It does not matter that you are right. The Queen Mother called. Listen, Starzer mouthed. It was a fraud, a trick. You can't. We must, Tichnat paused. For a long moment the great faceted eyes stared somberly. It was a splendid dream, the thing you offered us. But this is the final reality, and yours is but a dream. He tramped stolidly on after the others. The council hall door closed. Starza clawed at the door. It opened. He was too late. They sat silently around the great table, the faceted eyes dead, the antennae coruscating indigo, now green, now rose. Communion. The meshing of minds. Starza shouted at them. Stillness. Starza looked blindly at me. He was shaking. Carmody, he said. Carmody knows the term mind. He can do something. Come on, he said. We found Carmody in his quarters, methodically packing. His eyebrows rose as we burst in. Did you gentlemen ever try knocking? Starza just looked at him. Carmody drew a long breath. You'll find my resignation on your desk, Dave. Ah? Starza's voice was very soft. It's only a question of time, Carmody said. Call it the rat deserting the ship if you like, but I'm through. Starza was smiling, a fat man's smile. So you really think you can pull it off, he whispered. Carmody shrugged, and Starza calmly took out a sonic pistol and shot him in the belly. A sonic blast hemorrhages. It rends the capillaries, ploughs the flesh into a flaccid collection of shattered nerve fibres and ruined arteries. It's a rotten way to die. Starza watched Carmody thrash himself to death on the floor. I turned away. For the record, Jake, he made a full confession. We both heard him. Just for the record, I said. It had to be him, Starza said. That thoughtcaster blast yesterday morning made reference to your study on the term. Only Harvey and Carmody knew about that. It couldn't have been Harvey. He cut his throat this morning. I've decided, Starza said. This is a Type L planet, after all. The natives are chronically unstable. Hostile, in fact. Pursuant to Solar Regulation 3, we have the right to enforce martial law. It should be six months before an investigation. Meanwhile, we'll get production, I said. We'll get production. He wiped his forehead, relaxed. I'll send in a full report tonight. Better turn in, Jake, he said kindly. I'll need you in the morning. I turned in. You lie awake, staring into the blackness. It gnaws. My head throbbed. I should have felt a triumphant relief, but I could not remember my axioms and I felt a sick, dull hate for the thing the guild spy comedy had done to me. What happens when you strip a man of everything he believes in? He remembers other things. Those memories came trooping back like ghosts, and I fought them, sweating, but they came. Once upon a time there was a starry-eyed young engineer who started out to set the galaxy on fire, but he got squeamish somewhere along the way, so Carmody operated on him. Carmody did things to his brain, made a good production man out of him. I remembered now. That time I had argued with Starza about standards nine years ago, and I had resigned, and Starza sent me to Psyche. Good old Carmody. There would never be a white marble villa on Venus. It was a harmless dream, a substitute for what I had lost. But it didn't matter. Those superimposed patterns had been removed, that thoughtcaster had crippled my thinking, but by heaven I was still an amalgamated man. They couldn't take that away. But Starza had been wrong about Carmody. Nothing definite, but when you dedicate your life into extrapolating curves, frozen chunks of time and motion, into the thunder of jets lifting amalgamated ships from Terminorb, your mind becomes a very efficient analogue computer, if you know how to use. I used it now. I fed little things, facts, variables into that computer, and it told me three times. Probability, 60% at least. I got up, dressed stiffly. I was trembling. I could still serve after all. I took the lift up to administration and walked down that long grey corridor on leaden feet towards the illuminated rectangle of Starza's office. I opened the door. Hello, darling, 
Fern said. She was unhurriedly burning Starza's report. Starza sat mutely in his chair, head tilted back at an impossible angle, staring at nothing. It had to be you. I had never felt so tired. You would have destroyed the plant, wouldn't you? Only I showed you another way. Make the terms revert. And you had that hypo already when I reeled into Psyche. I moved towards her carefully. You're so damned altruistic. A guild mindless controlled, I said. Fern's smile was compassionate. She methodically ground the ashes to powder, lifted that calm green gaze. Stupid words to frighten children, Jake. Yes, they kidnapped me. I never reached Earth three months ago. I was indoctrinated. Oh, they didn't have far to go. Each race to its own fulfilment. Her eyes were shining. Look out the window. Numbly I moved past her. I stared. In the distant blackness a column of living flame flickered up the slope of Cobalt Mountain. Ice green, ruby, silver, and blue. The terms were leaving. They're not ready for individuality yet, Fern breathed. In a million years, perhaps. Not now. They're going home. To die? The race will live. Individuality isn't the penultimate, darling. You'll find out. I moved towards her. You've got a very tough mind, Jake. You'll make a wonderful guild agent. I got both hands on her throat. Fern moved. Her right arm was a snake striking, and a steel strength lifted me, turning against one and a half gravities, and the floor wavered up to hit me in the face. Something broke. I tasted blood. Through the agony I moved. I crawled towards her. They gave me six weeks of hand combat under two gravs, she said. Soon you'll be one of us, Jake. One of the guild. I stared up at her in a dull horror. I kept crawling. We'll heal you, Fern said. We'll give you back the dream. We may even work together. Maybe I'll fall in love with you again. Who knows? Her eyes were brimming. She took out a sonic pistol. It's all right, darling. I'll adjust it for knockout. In three hours we'll be on a guild flyer. Please, darling, she said, and I kept crawling. And Fern's smile was a benediction as she pulled the trigger. If you're enjoying the stories, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like button. Thanks. Gramp by Charles V. DeVette Narrated by William Skye It's tough to see into minds when you're only a child, and tougher still when you see what scares you. Why is Grandma making mad pictures at you? I asked Gramp. Gramp looked at me. What pictures, chum? Pictures in her mind, like you're lazy, and like she wanted to hurt you, I said. Gramp's eyes got wide. He kept looking at me, and then he said, Get your cap, chum. We're gonna take a little walk. Gramp didn't say anything until we walked all the way to the main road and past Mr. Watchorn's cornfield. I walked behind him, counting the little round holes his wooden leg made in the gravel. Finally, Gramp said, Abracadabra! That was our secret word. It meant that if I was playing one of our games, I was to stop for a while. Gramp and I had lots of games we played. One of them was where we made believe. Sometimes we'd play that Gramp and I had been working all day, when we really just stayed in the shade telling stories. Then when we got home and Grandma asked us what we had done, we'd tell her about how hard we had worked. I really did see mad pictures in Grandma's mind, I said. Have you ever seen pictures in anybody's mind before? Gramp asked. I always see them, I said. Don't you? No, Gramp said after a minute. Other people can't either. You're probably the only little boy who can. Is that bad? No, Gramp answered. It's good. But remember how I told you that people don't like other people who are different? Well, even though seeing pictures like you do is a wonderful thing, other people won't like you if they know you can do it. So we'll just keep it a secret between us. I was glad Gramp told me, because he always knows the best things to do. I'm his chum. I love him better than anyone else in the whole world. Whenever the other kids tease me and call me Crazy Joe, I go to Grump, and he tells me funny stories and makes me laugh. 
I remember the first time he told me about people hating other people who were different. Why do the kids call me Crazy Joe and laugh at me? I asked him. Well, you see, Gramp said slowly, your daddy worked for Uncle Sam in a big place where they make things that the government won't tell anybody about. Then your daddy got sick from something in the big place. After a long time he went up to stay with God. Then God took Mummy too, when he gave you to her. And now you're our little boy, mine and Grandma's. And because you're a very special kind of little boy, the other children are jealous. So I wouldn't play with them any more if they tease you. Just don't let them see you're afraid of them. You'll always be Gramp's little Joe. I love Gramp very much. We kept walking until we came to Fayette. We went into Carl Van Remortel's store. Gramp sat on a chair by the big iron stove, and I sat on his knee on his good leg. The stove must be real old because it's got 1926 on its door in big iron letters. Tell me the pictures you see in Mr. Van's mind, Gramp whispered in my ear, but don't let him hear you. He's making pictures of the fishing boats coming in, I said. In the pictures he's talking to Jack LaSalle and giving him some money for his fish. The pictures are getting all mixed up now. He's putting the fish in ice in boxes, but other pictures show him in church. Jack LaSalle is in the church too, and Mr. Van's sister Margaret is dressed in a long white dress and standing alongside him. He's thinking that Jack LaSalle will be marrying Margaret pretty soon, Gramp said. What else is he thinking? The pictures are coming so fast now that I can't name them all, I said. Mr. Lawrence St. Oars came into the store, and Gramp told me to read what he was thinking. I looked inside his head. He's making pictures of himself driving a car, and buying bread and bacon, and piling hay on his farm, and... I said, but then I had to stop. All the pictures come so fast that I can't read them, I told Gramp. Everybody makes blurry pictures like that most of the time. Instead of trying to tell me what the pictures are, see if you can understand what they mean, Gramp said. I tried, but it was awful hard, and pretty soon I got tired and Gramp and I left the store and went back home. The next morning, Gramp and I went out in the barn, and Gramp said, Now, let's see what we got here. He had me try to do a lot of things, like lifting something without touching it, and trying to make chickens run by making a picture of them doing that and putting it in their minds. But I couldn't do any of them. After a while, he said, Let's go down to the store again. We went to the store almost every day after that. Then sometimes we just walked around Fayette, and Gramp had me practice reading what the pictures in people's minds meant instead of just what they looked like. Sometimes I did it real good. Then Gramp would buy me some candy or ice cream. One day we were following Mr. Mears, and I was telling Gramp what I saw in Mr. Mears's mind when Mr. St. Oars drove by in his car. Mr. Mears is making pictures about feeding meat to Mr. St. Oars's dog, and the dog is crawling away and dying, I said to Gramp. Gramp was real interested. He said, Watch close and read everything you can about that. I did. After, Gramp seemed very happy. He bought me a big chocolate bar that time. Chocolate is my best kind of candy. I read lots of things in other people's minds that made Gramp feel good too, and he bought me candy just about every day. Gramp seemed to have money all the time now, instead of having to ask Grandma for any. She wanted to know where he got all the money. But he just smiled with his right cheek like he does and wouldn't tell her. Most of the people in town didn't seem to like Gramp anymore. They made mad pictures about him whenever we met them. Sometimes, when we were in the store, Mrs. Van would come in and she would talk to me. She was awful nice. But she always had sad pictures in her mind, and sometimes she would cough real hard and hold a handkerchief up in front of her mouth. When she did that, Mr. Van used to get sad too. In his pictures, Mrs. Van would be dead and laying in a coffin, and they would be burying her in a big hole in the ground. Mr. Van was nice too. 
he gave me crackers and cookies, or sometimes a big thin slice of cheese. One night, Gramp was holding me and buying some groceries, and Mr. Van was putting them in a cardboard box, and he was thinking about going to the bank in Escanaba and cashing a cheque. And the man gave him a big handful of money. I told Gramp, but then Mr. Van came close. I didn't say any more, like Gramp had told me. Mr. Van was whistling now. He made pictures of giving the money to Mrs. Van. She was getting on a train and going to a place where it was sunny all the time, and her cough went away and she wasn't skinny any more. In his mind, Mrs. Van was real pretty. She didn't have the long nose like she really has. When we got in our car, Gramp was excited. He asked me where Mr. Van had put the money he brought back from Escanaba. He had bad pictures in his mind about taking Mr. Van's money, and I didn't want to tell him. But he grabbed my arm so hard it hurt, and I began to cry. Gramp never hurt me before. "'What are you crying for?' he asked me, cranky. "'I don't want you to take Mr. Van's money,' I told him. Gramp let go of my arm and didn't say anything for a while. "'Sometimes the pictures you see aren't true,' he said. "'You know that.' He took out his blue handkerchief and made me blow my nose. "'Like when you see pictures in Grandma's mind about her hurting me,' he said. "'She never does, you know. So the pictures aren't true. It's just what we call imagination.' "'But your pictures are bad. They make me scared,' I said. We all make bad pictures like that, but we don't mean them, Gramp said. Remember how you said that you'd like to eat the whole apple pie last Sunday? You probably made pictures of doing that, but you never did because you know that Grandma and me should have some of it too. I guess Gramp can explain just about everything. So I told him where Mr. Van had hid the money under a box of brown sugar. Gramp smiled and started the car. He let me steer while it was going slow. Who's my chum? he asked. I am, I said, and I laughed real happy. The next day when I got up, Gramp was gone. I went back of the barn and played. I got a bunch of tin cans and punched holes in them with a nail like Gramp showed me, and I made steps out of rocks and put a can on each step. I poured water in the top can. It ran through the holes from each can to the other, all the way down the steps. I heard our car come in the front yard. I went around the barn, and Gramp was just going up the steps to the house. He had been to Fairport, where the big store is, and he had bought a lot of things that he was carrying in his arms. At first I was glad because he had bought something that was for me, too. But then I saw some bad pictures mixed with the happy ones of Gramp breaking a window in Mr. Van's store when it was dark, and going in and taking something from underneath the brown sugar box. "'You told me you wouldn't take Mr. Van's money, and you did!' I said. "'Shh!' Gramp said. He put his packages on the porch and sat down and took me on his lap. He took a deep breath. "'Remember what I told you about imagination, chum?' he asked me. So you know you're not supposed to believe all the pictures you see. Now, you're Gramp's chum, and I want you to promise me again not to tell anyone but me what you see, and I'll tell you if the pictures are real or not. Promise? I promised, and Gramp opened one of the packages. He took out two new pistols and a belt with double holsters to carry them in. He bent over and buckled them on me. You look just like Hoppy now, he said. I gave him a big kiss and ran back of the barn to shoot robbers. In the afternoon, Gramp was playing he was a bad Indian and trying to scalp me when a strange car drove in our yard. Mr. Van and two men with badges got out. Mr. Van was real mad. We've come after the money, Bill, he said. Gramp got white. He was scared, but he said loud, what the hell are you talking about? You know what, Bill, Mr. Van said. Someone saw you break into the store. It will go easier on you if you admit it. I told you I don't know what you're talking about, Gramp said. His eyes moved kind of quick. 
Then he noticed me, and he walked over to me. That's a fine way to talk in front of the boy, he said over his shoulder. He took my hand. Come on, chum, we're going in the house. Just a minute, the biggest policeman said. We've got a few questions that we have to ask you. Gramp made believe he was brushing some dirt from my pants. Did anyone see me take the money, chum? He whispered to me. No, I said, even though I didn't understand exactly. Mr. Van is just pretending he knows you took it, but he doesn't. Good boy, Gramp patted me on the head. Go into the house now. He turned and walked back to the three men, pushing his wooden leg into the ground hard. I didn't go in the house, though. Now I've had just about enough of this, Gramp said with a big frown on his face. You can't bluff me, Van. Say what you've got to say and get off my property. Mr. Van's shoulders seemed to sag, and he got sad. He made the pictures in his mind of Mrs. Van being dead and being put in a big hole. It made me so sorry I couldn't stand it, and I cried, Tell him you got his money under the seat in our car. Please, Gramp, give it back to him. Nobody said anything, but everybody turned and looked at me. They stood real still. I saw in Gramp's mind that I had been bad, bad. I ran to him and put my face in his coat and began to cry. I couldn't help it. After a minute, Gramp knelt on his good knee in front of me and took my cheeks in both his hands. I've let you down, chum, he said. He wasn't mad any more. He picked me up in his arms. You needed me, little Joe, he said. You needed me. His eyes were all smudgy. He squeezed me so hard I couldn't breathe, almost. Then he put me down and said, Come on, to the two policemen. He walked away between them. Gramp! The pictures in his mind were awful. I could hardly bear to look at them. The worst picture was... me. I cried and cried. Death of a Spaceman by Walter M. Miller, Jr. Narrated by William Skye The manner in which a man has lived is often the key to the way he will die. Take old man Donegal, for example. Most of his adult life was spent in digging a hole through space to learn what was on the other side. Would he go out the same way? Old Donegal was dying. They had all known it was coming, and they watched it come, his haggard wife, his daughter, and now his grandson home on emergency leave from the Pre-Astronautics Academy. Old Donegal knew it too, and had known it from the beginning when he had begun to lose control of his legs and was forced to walk with a cane. But most of the time he pretended to let them keep the secret they shared with the doctors, that the operations had all been failures, and that the cancer that fed at his spine would gnaw its way brainward until the paralysis engulfed vital organs, and then old Donegal would cease to be. It would be cruel to let them know that he knew. Once, weeks ago, he had joked about the approaching shadows. By the plot back where people won't walk over it, Martha, he said. Get it way back under the cedars, next to the fence. There aren't many graves back there yet. I want to be alone. Don't talk that way, Donny, his wife had choked. You're not dying. His eyes twinkled maliciously. Listen, Martha, I want to be buried face down. I want to be buried with my back to space, understand? Don't let them lay me out like a lily. Donny, please. They ought to face a man the way he's headed, Donegal grunted. I've been up, way up. Now I'm going straight down. Martha had fled from the room in tears. He had never done it again, except to the interns and nurses, who, while they insisted that he was going to get well, didn't mind joking with him about it. Martha can bear my death, he thought, can bear pre-knowledge of it. 
but she couldn't bear thinking that he might take it calmly. If he accepted death gracefully, it would be like deliberately leaving her, and old Donegal had decided to help her believe whatever would be comforting to her in such a troublesome moment. "'When'll they let me out of this bed again?' he complained. "'Be patient, Donny,' she sighed. "'It won't be long. You'll be up and around before you know it.' "'Back on the moon run, maybe,' he offered. "'Listen, Martha, I've been planet-bound too long. I'm not too old for the moon run, am I? Sixty-three's not so old.' That had been carrying things too far. She knew he was hoaxing, and dabbed at her eyes again. The dead must humour the mourners, he thought, and the sick must comfort the visitors. It was always so. But it was harder now that the end was near. His eyes were hazy and his thoughts unclear. He could move his arms a little, clumsily, but feeling was gone from them. The rest of his body was lost to him. Sometimes he seemed to feel his stomach and his hips, but the sensation was mostly an illusion offered by higher nervous centres, like the ghost arm that an amputee continues to feel. The wires were down, and he was cut off from himself. He lay wheezing on the hospital bed in his own room, in his own rented flat. Gaunt and unshaven, grey as winter twilight, he lay staring at the white net curtains that billowed gently in the breeze from the open window. There was no sound in the room but the sound of breathing and the loud ticking of an alarm clock. Occasionally he heard a chair scraping on the stone terrace next door, and the low mutter of voices, sometimes laughter, as the servants of the Keith mansion arranged the terrace for late afternoon guests. With considerable effort he rolled his head toward Martha who sat beside the bed, pinch-faced and weary. "'You ought to get some sleep.' he said. I slept yesterday. Don't talk, Donny, it tires you. You ought to get more sleep. You never sleep enough. Are you afraid I'll get up and run away if you go to sleep for a while? She managed a brittle smile. There'll be plenty of time for sleep when, when you're well again. The brittle smile fled and she swallowed hard like swallowing a fishbone. He glanced down and noticed that she was squeezing his hand spasmodically. There wasn't much left of the hand, he thought. Bones and ugly tight-stretched hides spotted with brown. Bulging knuckles with yellow cigarette stains. My hand. He tried to tighten it, tried to squeeze Martha's thin one in return. He watched it open and contract a little, but it was like operating a remote control mechanism. Goodbye, Hand. You're leaving me the way my legs did, he told it. I'll see you again in hell. How hammy can you get, old Donegal? You maudlin ass. Requiescat, he muttered over the hand, and let it lie in peace. Perhaps she heard him. Donny, she whispered, leaning closer. Won't you let me call the priest now, please? He rattled a sigh and rolled his head toward the window again. "'Are the Keiths having a party today?' he asked. "'Sounds like they're moving chairs out on the terrace.' "'Please, Donny, the priest.' He let his head roll aside and closed his eyes as if asleep. The bed shook slightly as she quickly caught at his wrist to feel for a pulse. "'If I'm not dying, I don't need a priest.' he said sleepily. That's not right, she scolded softly. You know that's not right, Donny. You know better. Maybe I'm being too rough on her, he wondered. He hadn't minded getting baptised her way and married her way and occasionally priest-handled the way she wanted him to when he was home from a space run, but when it came to dying, old Donegal wanted to do it his own way. He opened his eyes at the sound of a bench being dragged across the stone terrace. Martha, what kind of a party are the Keiths having today? I wouldn't know, she said stiffly. You'd think they'd have a little more respect. You'd think they'd put it off a few days. Until? Until you feel better. 
I feel fine, Martha. I like parties. I'm glad they're having one. Pour me a drink, will you? I can't reach the bottle any more. It's empty. No, it isn't, Martha. It's still a quarter full. I know. I've been watching it. You shouldn't have it, Donny. Please don't. But this is a party, Martha. Besides, the doctor says I can have whatever I want. Whatever I want, you hear? That means I'm getting well, doesn't it? Sure, Donny, sure. Getting well. The whiskey, Martha. Just a finger in a tumbler, no more. I want to feel like it's a party. Her throat was rigid as she poured it. She helped him get the tumbler to his mouth. The liquor seared his throat, and he gagged a little as the fumes clogged his nose. Good whiskey, the best, but he couldn't take it any more. He eyed the green stamp on the neck of the bottle on the bed table and grinned. He hadn't had whiskey like that since his space days. Couldn't afford it now, not on a blastman's pension. He remembered how he and Cade used to smuggle a couple of fifths aboard for the moon run. If they caught you, it meant suspension, but there was no harm in it, not for the blast room men who had nothing much to do from the time the ship acquired enough velocity for the long, long coaster ride until they started the rockets again for lunar landing. You could drink a fifth, jettison the bottle through the trash lock, and sober up before you were needed again. It was the only way to pass the time in the cramped cubicle, unless you ruined your eyes trying to read by the glow lamps. Old Donegal chuckled. If he and Cade had stayed on the run, Earth would have a ring by now, like Saturn, a ring of old grandad bottles. You said it, Donny boy, said the misty man by the billowing curtains. Who else knows the Gagenshine is broken glass? Donegal laughed. Then he wondered what the man was doing there. The man was lounging against the window, and his unzipped space rig draped about him in an old familiar way. Loose plug-in connections and hose-ends dangled about his lean body. He was freckled and grinning. Kate, old Donegal breathed softly. "'What did you say, Donny?' Martha answered. Old Donegal blinked hard and shook his head. Something let go with a soggy snap, and the misty man was gone. I'd better take it easy on the whiskey, he thought. You got to wait, Donegal, old lush, until Nora and Ken get here. You can't get drunk until they're gone, or you might get them mixed up with memories like Cade's. Car doors slammed in the street below. Martha glanced toward the window. Think it's them? I wish they'd get here. I wish they'd hurry. Martha arose and tiptoed to the window. She peered down the sidewalk, put on a sharp frown. He heard a distant mutter of voices and occasional laughter, with group footsteps milling about on the sidewalk. Martha murmured her disapproval and closed the window. "'Leave it open,' he said. "'But the Keith's guests are starting to come. There'll be such a racket.' She looked at him hopefully, the way she did when she prompted his manners before company came. Maybe it wasn't decent to listen in on a party when you were dying, he thought. But that wasn't the reason. Donegal, your chamber pressure's dropping off. Your brains are in your butt end, where a spacer's brains belong. But your butt end died last month. She wants the window closed for her own sake, not yours. Leave it closed, he grunted. But open it again before the moon run blasts off. I want to listen. She smiled and nodded, glancing at the clock. It'll be an hour and a half yet. I'll watch the time. I hate that clock. I wish you'd throw it out. It's loud. It's your medicine clock, Donny. She came back to sit down at his bedside again. She sat in silence. The clock filled the room with its clicking pulse. What time are they coming? he asked. Nora and Ken? They'll be here soon. Don't fret. Why should I fret? he chuckled. That boy. He'll be a good spacer, won't he, Martha? Martha said nothing, fanned at a fly that crawled across his pillow. The fly buzzed up in an angry spiral and alighted on the ceiling. 
Donegal watched it for a time. The fly had natural-born space legs. I know your tricks, he told it with a smile, and I learned to walk on the bottom side of things before you were a maggot. You stand there with your magnasoles hanging to the hull, and the rest of you's in freefall. You jerk a soul loose and your knee flies up to your belly, and reaction spins you half around and near throws your other hip out of joint if you don't jam the foot down fast and jerk up the other. It's worse than trying to run through knee-deep mud with snowshoes, and a man'll go nuts trying to keep his arms and legs from taking off in odd directions. I know your tricks, Fly. But the Fly was born with his magnasoles, and he trotted across the ceiling like Donegal never could. That boy, Ken. He ought to make a damn good space engineer, wheezed the old man. Her silence was long, and he rolled his head toward her again. Her lips tight, she stared down at the palm of his hand, unfolded his bony fingers, felt the cracked calluses that still welted the shrunken skin, calluses worn there by the linings of space gauntlets and the handles of fuel valves and the rungs of get-about ladders during freefall. "'I don't know if I should tell you,' she said. "'Tell me what, Martha?' She looked up slowly, scrutinising his face. Ken's changed his mind, Nora says. Ken doesn't like the academy. She says he wants to go to medical school. Old Donegal thought it over, nodded absently. That's fine. Space medics get good pay. He watched her carefully. She lowered her eyes, rubbed at his calluses again. She shook her head slowly. He doesn't want to go to space. The clock clicked loudly in the closed room. "'I thought I ought to tell you so you won't say anything to him about it,' she added. Old Donegal looked greyer than before. After a long silence he rolled his head away and looked toward the limp curtains. "'Open the window, Martha.' Her tongue clucked faintly as she started to protest, but she said nothing. After frozen seconds, she sighed and went to open it. The curtains billowed and a babble of conversation blew in from the terrace of the Keith mansion. With the sound came the occasional brassy discord of a musician tuning his instrument. She clutched the window sash as if she wished to slam it closed again. Well, music, grunted old Donegal. That's good. This is some shebang. Good whiskey and good music and you. He chuckled, but it choked off into a fit of coughing. Donny, about Ken. No matter, Martha, he said hastily. Space medics pay as good. But Donny, she turned from the window, stared at him briefly, then said, Sure, Donny, sure, and came back to sit down by his bed. He smiled at her affectionately. She was a man's woman, was Martha, always had been, still was. He had married her the year he had gone to space, a lissom, wistful, old-fashioned lass, with big violet eyes and gentle hands and gentle thoughts, and she had never complained about the long and lonely weeks between blast-off and glide-down, when most spacers' wives listened to the psychiatrists and soap operas, and soon developed the symptoms that were expected of them, either because the symptoms were chic, or because they felt they should do something to earn the pity that was extended to them. "'It's not so bad,' Martha had assured him. "'The house keeps me busy till Nora's home from school, and then there's a flock of kids around till dinner. Nights are a little empty, but if there's a moon I can always go out on the porch and look at it and know where you are. And Nora gets out the telescope you built her, and we make a game of it. Seeing if Daddy's still at the office, she calls it.' Those were the days, he muttered. What, Donny? Do you remember that Steve Farron song? She paused, frowning thoughtfully. There were a lot of Steve Farron songs, but after a moment she picked the right one and sang it softly. O oh moon, where o'er oh the clouds fly, beyond the willow tree, there is a rambling space guy I wish you'd save for me. Mare tranquillitatis, O oh dark and tranquil sea, until he drops from heaven, rest him there with thee. Her voice cracked, and she laughed. 
Old Donegal chuckled weakly. Fried mush, he said. That one made the cats wilt their ears and wail at the moon. I feel real crazy, he added. And me the King Kong, Fluff Muff. Keep cool, Daddy-O, you've had enough. Martha reddened and patted his arm, looking pleased. Neither of them had talked that way, even in the old days, but the outdated slang brought back memories, school parties, dances at the Rocketport Club, the early years of the war when Donegal had jockeyed an R-43 fighter in the close space assaults against the Soviet satellite project. The memories were good. A brassy blare of modern slide arose suddenly from the Keith Terrace as the small orchestra launched into its first number. Martha caught an angry breath and started toward the window. Leave it, he said. It's a party. Whiskey, Martha, please, just a small one. She gave him a hurtful glance. Whiskey, then you can call the priest. Donny, it's not right. You know it's not right to bargain for such as that. All right. Whiskey. Forget the priest. She poured it for him and helped him get it down, and then went out to make the phone call. Old Donegal lay shuddering over the whiskey taste and savouring the burn in his throat. Jesus, but it was good. You old bastard, he thought. You got no right to enjoy life when nine-tenths of you is dead already, and the rest is foggy as a thermal dust rise on the Luna Maria at Hell Dawn. But it wasn't a bad way to die. It ate your consciousness away from the feet up, it gnawed away the present, but it let you keep the past, until everything faded and blended. Maybe that's what eternity was, he thought. One man's subjective past, all wrapped up and packaged for shipment a single space-time entity, a one-man microcosm of memories when nothing else remains. If I've got a soul, I made it myself, he told the grey nun at the foot of his bed. The nun held out a pie pan, rattled a few coins in it. Contribute to the radiation victim's relief? The nun purred softly. I know you, he said. You're my conscience. You hang around the officer's mess, and when we get back from a sortie, you make us pay for the damage we did. But that was forty years ago. The nun smiled, and her luminous eyes were on him softly. Mother of God, he breathed and reached for the whiskey. His arm obeyed. The last drink had done him good. He had to watch his hand to see where it was going, and squeezed the neck until his fingers whitened so that he knew that he had it but he got it off the table and onto his chest, and he got the cork out with his teeth. He had a long pull at the bottle, and it made his eyes water and his hands grow weak. But he got it back to the table without spelling a bit, and he was proud of himself. The room was spinning like the cabin of a gyro-graved ship. By the time he wrestled it to a standstill, the nun was gone. The blare of music from the Keith Terrace was louder, and laughing voices blended with it. Chairs scraping and glasses rattling. A fine party, Keith. I'm glad you picked today. This shebang would be the younger Keith's affair. Ronald Tonweiler Keith the Third, scion of Orbital Engineering and Construction Company, builders of the moon shuttle ships that made the run from the satellite station to Luna and back. It's good to have such important neighbours, he thought. He wished he had been able to meet them while he was still up and about. But the Keith's place was walled in, and when a Keith came out, he charged out in a limousine with a chauffeur at the wheel, and the iron gate closed again. The Keiths built the wall when the surrounding neighbourhood began to grow shabby with age. It had once been the best of neighbourhoods, but that was before old Donegal lived in it. Now it consisted of sooty old houses and rented flats, and the Keith place was really not a part of it any more. Nevertheless, it was really something when a pensioned blastman could say, I live out close to the Keiths, you know, the Ronald Keiths. At least, that's what Martha always told him. The music was so loud that he never heard the doorbell ring, but when a lull came, he heard Nora's voice downstairs, and listened hopefully for Ken's. But when they came up, the boy was not with them. 
Hello, skinny britches, he greeted his daughter. Nora grinned and came over to kiss him. Her hair dangled about his face, and he noticed that it was blacker than usual, with the grey streaks gone from it again. You smell good, he said. You don't, Pops. You smell like a sot. Naughty. Where's Ken? She moistened her lips nervously and looked away. He couldn't come. He had to take a driver's lessons. He really couldn't help it. If he didn't go, he'd lose his turn, and then he wouldn't finish before he goes back to the academy. She looked at him apologetically. It's all right, Nora. If he missed it, he wouldn't get his copter license until summer. It's okay. Copters. Hell, the boy should be in jets by now. Several breaths passed in silence. She gazed absently toward the window and shook her head. No jets, Pop. Not for Ken. He glowered at her. Listen, how will he get into space? He's got to get his jet licenses first. Can't get in rockets without them. Nora shot a quick glance at her mother. Martha rolled her eyes as if sighing patiently. Nora went to the window to stare down toward the Keith Terrace. She tucked a cigarette between scarlet lips, lit it, blew nervous smoke against the pane. Mom, can't you call them and have that racket stopped? Donny says he likes it. Nora's eyes flitted over the scene below. Female butterflies and puppy dogs in sport jackets. And the cadets, she snorted. Cadets! Imagine Ron Keith III ever going to space. The old man buys his way into the academy and they throw a brawl as if Ronnie passed the compets. Maybe he did, growled old Donegal. Ha! Huh. They live in a different world, I guess, Martha sighed. If it weren't for men like Pops, they'd never have made their fortune. I like the music, I tell you, grumbled the old man. I'm half a mind to go over there and tell them off, Nora murmured. Let them alone, just so they'll stop the racket for blast away. Look at them, polite little pattern cuts all alike. They take pre-space because it's the thing to do, then they quit before the payoff comes. How do you know they'll quit? That party, I bet it costs six months' pay, spacers' pay, she went on, ignoring him. And what do real spacers get? Only gets killed and Pop's pension wouldn't feed the Keith's cat. You don't understand, girl. I lost Oli. I understand enough. He watched her silently for a moment, then closed his eyes. It was no good trying to explain. No good trying to tell her that Doe didn't mean a damn thing. She'd been a spacer's wife, and that was bad enough, but now she was a spacer's widow. And Oli? Oli's tomb revolved around the sun in an eccentric orbit that spun in close to Mercury, then reached out into the asteroid belt once every 725 days. When it came within rocket radius of Earth, it whizzed past at close to 15 miles a second. You don't rescue a ship like that, skinny britches, my darling daughter. Nor do you salvage it after the crew stops screaming for help. If you use enough fuel to catch it, you won't get back. You just leave such a ship there forever, like an asteroid. And it's a damn shame about the men trapped aboard. Heroes all, no doubt, but the smallness of the widow's monthly check failed to confirm the heroism, and Nora was bitter about the price of Oli's memory, perhaps. Ouch. Old Donegal, you know she's not like that. It's just that she can't understand about space. You ought to make her understand. But did he really understand himself? You ride hot in a roaring blast room, hands tense on the mixer controls and the pumps, eyes glued to instruments, body sucked down in a full gravity thrust, and wait for the command to choke it off. Then you float free and weightless in a long nightmare as the beast coasts moonward, a flung javelin. The romance of space, drivel written in the old days. When you're not blasting, you float in a cramped hot box, crawl through dirty mazes of greasy pipe and cable to tighten a lug, scratch your arms and bark your shins, 
get sick and choked up because no gravity helps your gullet get the food down. Liquid is worse, but you gag your whiskey down because you have to. Stars? You see stars by squinting through a viewing lens, and it's like a phototransparency, and if you aren't careful, you'll get an eye full of old blinder and back off with a punch-drunk retina. Adventure? Unless the skipper calls for course correction, you float around in the blast cubicle with damn little to do between blast away and moon down, except sweat out the omniscient accident statistics. If the beast blows up or gets gutted in space, a statistic had your name on it, that's all, and there's no fighting back. You stay outwardly sane because you're a hog for punishment. If you weren't, you'd never get past the psychologists. Did you like horror movies when you were a kid? asked the psych, and you damn well better answer yes if you want to go to space. Tell her, old man, you're her pop. Tell her why it's worth it, if you know. You jail yourself in a coffin-sized cubicle, and a crazy beast thunders berserk for uncontrollable seconds, and then you saw an ominous silence for the long, long hours. Grow sweaty, filthy, sick, miserable, idle, somewhere out in big empty, where man's got no business except the trouble he always makes for himself wherever he goes. Tell her why it's worth it for pay less than a good bricklayer's. Tell her why Oli would do it again. It's a sucker's run, Nora, he said. You go looking for kicks, but the only kicks you get to keep is what Oli got. God knows why, but it's worth it. Nora said nothing. He opened his eyes slowly. Nora was gone. Had she been there at all? He blinked around at the fuzzy room and dissolved the shifting shadows that sometimes emerged as old friendly faces grinning at him. He found Martha. You went to sleep, said Martha. She had to go. Kenny called. He'll be over later if you're not too tired. I'm not tired. I'm all head. There's nothing much to get tired. I love you, old Donegal. Hold my hand again. I'm holding it, old man. Then hold me where I can feel it. She slid a thin arm under his neck and bent over his face to kiss him. She was crying a little, and he was glad she could do it now without fleeing the room. Can I talk about dying now? he wondered aloud. She pinched her lips together and shook her head. I lie to myself, Martha. You know how much I lie to myself? She nodded slowly and stroked his grey temples. I lie to myself about Ken, and about dying. If Ken turned spacer, I wouldn't die, that's what I told myself, you know? She shook her head. Don't talk, Donny, please. A man makes his own soul, Martha. That's not true. You shouldn't say things like that. A man makes his own soul, but it dies with him, unless he can pour it into his kids and his grandchildren before he goes. I lied to myself. Ken's a yellow belly. Nora made him one, and the boots won't fit. Don't, Donny. You'll excite yourself again. I was going to give him the boots, the overboots with magnasoles. But they won't fit him. They won't ever fit him. He's a lily-livered lapdog, and he whines. Bring me my boots, woman. Donny! The boots. They're in my locker in the attic. I want them. What on earth? Bring me my golden space boots and put them on my feet. I'm going to wear them. You can't. The priest's coming. Well, get them anyway. What time is it? You didn't let me sleep through the moon run blast, did you? She shook her head. It's half an hour yet. I'll get the boots if you promise not to make me put them on you. I want them on. You can't until Father Paul's finished. Do I have to get my feet buttered? She sighed. I wish you wouldn't say things like that. I wish you wouldn't, Donny. It's sacrilege, you know it is. All right, 
Anointed, he corrected wearily. Yes, you do. The boots, woman, the boots. She went to get them. While she was gone, the doorbell rang, and he heard her quick footsteps on the stairs, and then Father Paul's voice asking about the patient. Old Donegal groaned inwardly. After the priest, the doctor would come, at the usual time, to see if he were dead yet. The doctor had let him come home from the hospital to die, and the doctor was getting impatient. Why don't they let me alone? he growled. Why don't they let me handle it in my own way and stop making a fuss over it? I can die and do a good job of it without a lot of outside interference, and I wish they'd quit picking at me with syringes and sacraments and enemas. All he wanted was a chance to listen to the orchestra on the Keith Terrace, to drink the rest of his whiskey, and to hear the beast blast away for the satellite on the first lap of the run to Luna. It's going to be my last day, he thought. My eyes are going fuzzy, and I can't breathe right, and the throbbing's hurting my head. Whether he lived through the night wouldn't matter, because delirium was coming over him, and then there would be the coma and the symbolic fight to keep him pumping and panting. I'd rather die tonight and get it over with, he thought, but they probably won't let me go. He heard their voices coming up the stairs. Nora tried to get them to stop it, father, but she couldn't get in to see anybody but the butler. He told her he'd tell Mrs. Keith, but nothing happened. It's just as loud as before. Well, as long as Donny doesn't mind. He just says that. You know how he is. What are they celebrating, Martha? Young Ronald's leaving for pre-space training. It's a going-away affair. They paused in the doorway. The small priest smiled in at Donegal and nodded. He set his black bag on the floor and sighed, winked solemnly at the patient. "'I'll leave you two alone,' said Martha. She closed the door and her footsteps wandered off down the hall. Donegal and the young priest eyed each other warily. "'You look like hell, Donegal,' the padre offered jovially. "'Feeling nasty? Skip the small talk. Let's get this routine over with.' The priest humphed thoughtfully, sauntered across to the bed, gazed down at the old man disinterestedly. "'What's the matter? Don't want the routine? Rather play it tough?' "'What's the difference?' he growled. "'Hurry up and get out. I want to hear the beast blast off.' "'You won't be able to,' said the priest, glancing at the window, now closed again. "'That's quite a racket next door.' They'd better stop for it. They'd better quiet down for it. They'll have to turn it off for five minutes or so. Maybe they won't. It was a new idea, and it frightened him. He liked the music and the party's gaiety, the nearness of youth and good times, but it hadn't occurred to him that it wouldn't stop so he could hear the beast. Don't get upset, Donegal. You know what a blast-off sounds like. But it's the last one, the last time, I want to hear. How do you know it's the last time? Hell, don't I know when I'm kicking off? Maybe, maybe not. It's hardly your decision. It's not, eh? Old Donegal fumed. Well, by God, you'd think it wasn't. You'd think it was Martha's and yours and that damn fool medic's. You'd think I'd got no say-so. Who's doing it anyway? I would guess, Father Paul grunted sourly, that Providence might appreciate his fair share of the credit. Old Donegal made a surly noise and hunched his head back into the pillow to glower. You want me? the priest asked. Or is this just a case of wifely conscience? What's the difference? Give me the business and scram. No soap. Do you want the sacrament, or are you just being kind to your wife? If it's for Martha, I'll go now. Old Donegal glared at him for a time, then wilted. The priest brought his bag to the bedside. Bless me, father, for I have sinned. Bless you, son. 
I accuse myself. Tension, anger, helplessness. They had piled up on him, and now he was feeling the after-effects. Vertigo, nausea, and the black confetti. A bad spell. The whiskey. If he could only reach the whiskey. Then he remembered he was receiving a sacrament and struggled to get on with it. Tell him, old man. Tell him of your various rottennesses and vile transgressions, if you can remember some. A sin is whatever you're sorry for, maybe. But, old Donegal, you're sorry for the wrong things, and this young Jesuitical gadget wouldn't like listening to it. I'm sorry I didn't get it instead of Oli, and I'm sorry I fought in the war. And I'm sorry I can't get out of this bed and take a belt to my daughter's backside for making a puny whelp out of Ken. And I'm sorry I gave Martha such a rough time all these years, and wound up dying in a cheap flat instead of giving her things like the Keiths had. I wish I had been a sharpster, contractor, or thief, instead of a common labouring spacer whose species lost its glamour after the war. Listen, old man, you made your soul yourself, and it's yours. This young dispenser of oils, substances, and mysteries wishes only to help you scrape off the rough edges and gouge out the bad spots. He will not steal it, nor distort it with his supernatural chisels, nor make fun of it. He can take nothing away, but only cauterize and neutralize, he says. So why not let him try? Tell him the rotten messes. Are you finished, my son? Old Donegal nodded wearily and said what he was asked to say, and heard the soft mutter of Latin that washed him inside and behind his ghostly ears. Ego te absolvo in nomine patris. And he accepted the rest of it lying quietly in the candlelight and the red glow of the sunset through the window, while the priest anointed him and gave him bread and read the words of the soul in greeting its spouse. I was asleep, but my heart waked. It is the voice of my beloved calling. Come to me, my love, my dove, my undefiled. And from beyond the closed window came the sarcastic wail of a clarinet, painting hot slides against a rhythmic background. It wasn't so bad, old Donegal thought when the priest was done. He felt like a schoolboy in a starched shirt on Sunday morning and it wasn't a bad feeling, though it left him weak. The priest opened the window for him again, and repacked his bag. Ten minutes till blast-off, he said. I'll see what I can do about the racket next door. When he was gone, Martha came back in, and he looked at her face and was glad. She was smiling when she kissed him, and she looked less tired. Is it all right for me to die now? he grunted. Donny, don't start that again. Where's the boots? You promised to bring them. They're in the hall. Donny, you don't want them. I want them. And I want a drink of whiskey. And I want to hear them fire the beast. He said it slow and hard, and he left no room for argument. When she had got the huge boots over his shrunken feet, the magnasoles clanged against the iron bed frame and clung there, and she rolled him up so that he could look at them, and old Donegal chuckled inside. He felt warm and clean and pleasantly dizzy. The whiskey, Martha, and for God's sake make them stop the noise till after the firing, please. She went to the window and looked out for a long time. Then she came back and poured him an insignificant drink. Well, I don't know, she said. I saw Father Paul on the terrace talking to somebody. Is it time? She glanced at the clock, looked at him doubtfully, and nodded. Nearly time. The orchestra finished a number, but the babble of laughing voices continued. Old Donegal sagged. They won't do it. They're the Keiths, Martha. Why should I ruin their party? She turned to stare at him, slowly shook her head. He heard someone shouting, but then a trumpet started softly, introducing a new number. Martha sucked in a hurt breath 
pressed her hands together, and hurried from the room. It's too late, he said after her. Her footsteps stopped on the stairs. The trumpet was alone. Donegal listened, and there was no babble of voices, and the rest of the orchestra was silent. Only the trumpet sang, and it puzzled him, hearing the same slow bugle notes of the call played at the lowering of the colours. The trumpet stopped suddenly. Then he knew it had been for him. A brief hush, then thunder came from the blast station two miles to the west. First the low reverberation rattling the windows, then the rising growl as the sleek beast knifed skyward on a column of blue-white hell. It grew and grew until it drowned the distant traffic sounds and dominated the silence outside. Quit crying, you old fool, you maudlin ass. My boots, he whispered. My boots, please. You've got them on, Donny. He sank quietly then. He closed his eyes and let his heart go up with the beast, and he sank into the gravity padding of the blast room, and Cade was with him, and Oli. And when Ronald Keith III instructed the orchestra to play Blast Room Man after the beast's rumble had waned, old Donegal was on his last moon run, and he was grinning. He'd had a good day. Martha went to the window to stare out at the thin black trail that curled starward above the blast station through the twilight sky. Guests on the terrace were watching it too. The doorbell rang. That would be Ken. Too late. She closed the window against the chill breeze and went back to the bed. The boots, the heavy, clumsy boots, they clung to the bed frame with his feet half out of them. She took them off gently and set them out of company's sight. Then she went to answer the door. Remember to hit the like button to support the channel. Thank you. The Last Gentleman by Rory McGill Narrated by William Skye The explosion brought Jim Peters upright in bed. He sat there, leaning back on the heels of his hands, blinking stupidly at the wall. His vision cleared, and he looked down at Myra, just stirring beside him. Myra opened her eyes. Jim said, Did you feel that? Myra yawned. I thought I was dreaming. It was an explosion or something, wasn't it? Jim's lips set grimly. After ten years of Cold War, there was only one appropriate observation, and he made it. I guess maybe this is it. As by common agreement, they got out of bed and pulled on their robes. They went downstairs and out into the warm summer night. Other people had come out of their homes also. Shadowy figures moved and collected in the darkness. Sounded right on top of us. I was looking out the window, didn't see no flash. Must have been further away than it seemed. This last was spoken hopefully and reflected the mood of all the people. Maybe it wasn't the bomb after all. Oddly, no one had thought to consult a radio. The thought struck them as a group, and they broke into single and double units again, hurrying back into the houses. Lights began coming on here and there. Jim Peters took Myra's hand unconsciously as they hurried up the porch steps. Hugh would know, Jim said. I kind of wish Hugh was here. Myra laughed lightly, a calculated laugh, meant to disguise the gravity of this terrible thing. That's not very patriotic, Jim. If that was the bomb, Hugh will be kept busy making other bombs to send back to them. But he'd know. I'll bet he could tell just by the sound of it. Jim smiled quietly in the darkness, proudly. It wasn't everybody who had a genius for a brother. A nuclear scientist didn't happen in every family. Hugh was somebody to be proud of. 
They turned on the radio and sat huddled in front of it. The tubes warmed with maddening slowness. Then there came the deliberately impersonal voice of the announcer. On the strength of reports now in, it appears the enemy bungled badly. Instead of crippling the nation, they succeeded only in alerting it. The bombs, at this time there appear to have been five of them dropped, formed a straight north-south line across western United States. One detonated close to the Idaho-Utah line. The other four were placed at almost equidistant points to the south, the fifth bomb, according to first reports, exploding in a Mexican desert. We have been informed that Calas, Utah, a town of 900 persons, has been completely annihilated. For further reports, keep tuned to the station. A dance band cut in. Jim got up from his chair. They certainly did bungle, he said. Imagine wasting four atom bombs like that. Myra got up also. Would you like some coffee? That'd be a good idea. I don't feel like going back to bed. I want to listen for more reports. But there were no more reports. An hour passed. Another and another. Jim spun the dials and got either silence or the cheerful blatherings of some inane disc jockey who prattled on as though nothing had happened. Finally, Jim snapped the set off. Censorship, he said. Now we're going to see what it's really like. In the morning, they gathered again in groups, the villagers in this little community of five hundred, and discussed the shape of things to come as they visualized them. It'll take a little time to get into action, old Sam Bennett said. Even expecting it, and with how fast things move these days, it'll take time. If they invade us, come down from the north, you think the government will let us know they're coming? You can't tell. Censorship is a funny thing. In the last war, we knew more about what was going on in Europe than the people that lived there. At that moment, old Mrs. Kendall fainted dead away and had to be carried home. Three men carried her, and Tom Edwards was one of them. Kind of heavy, ain't she? Tom said. I never thought Mary weighed much more than a hundred. That night the village shook. In his home, Jim staggered against the wall. Myra fell to the floor. There were two tremors, the second worse than the first. Then things steadied away, and he helped Myra to her feet. But there wasn't any noise, Myra whispered. The whisper was loud in the silence. That was an earthquake, Jim said. Nothing to worry about. Might be one of the bomb's after-effects. The quake did no great damage in the village, but it possibly contributed to old Mrs. Kendall's death. She passed on an hour later. Poor old lady, a neighbour told Myra. She was plain weary. That was what she said just before she closed her eyes. Hazel, she said, I'm just plum tuckered. The neighbour wiped her face with her apron and turned toward home. Think I'll lie down for a spell. I'm tuckered myself. Can't take things like I used to. Now it was a week after the earthquake, two weeks after the falling of the bombs, and the town went on living. But it was strange, very strange. Art Cordell voiced the general opinion when he said, You know, we waited a long time for the thing to happen. We kind of visualised, maybe, how it'd be. But I didn't figure it'd be anything like this. Maybe there isn't any war. Jim said. Washington hasn't said so. Censorship. But isn't that carrying censorship a little too far? The people ought to be told whether or not they're at war. But the people didn't seem to care. A deadening lethargy had settled over them. A lethargy they felt and questioned in their own minds, but didn't talk about much. Talking itself seemed to have become an effort. This continued weariness, this dragging of one foot after another, was evidently the result of radiation from the bombs. What other place could it come from? The radiation got blamed for just about everything untoward that happened. It caused Jenkins' apples to fall before they were half ripe. Something about it bent the young wheat to the ground where it mildewed and rotted. 
Some even blamed the radiation for the premature birth of Jane Ellman's baby, even though such things had happened before even gunpowder was invented. But it certainly was a strange war. Nothing came over the radio at all. Nobody seemed to care, really. Probably because they were just plain too tired. Jim Peters dragged himself to and from work in sort of a daze. Myra got her housework done, but it was a greater effort every day. All she could think of was the time she could drop on the lounge for a rest. She didn't care much whether a war was going on or not. People had quit waiting for them to come down from the north. They knew that the places where the bombs had fallen were guarded like Fort Knox. Nobody got in or out. Jim remembered the flash, the colour, the rumours, the excitement of World War II. The grim resolution of the people to buckle down and win it. Depots jammed. Kids going off to join. But nobody went to join this war. That was funny. Somehow Jim hadn't thought of that before. None of the kids was being called up. Did they have enough men? Washington didn't say. Washington didn't say anything. And the people didn't seem to care. That was the strange thing when you could get your tired mind to focus on it. The people didn't care. They were too busily occupied with the grim business of putting one foot in front of the other. Jim got home one evening to find Myra staring dully at a small handful of ground meat. That's a pound, she said. Jim frowned. What do you mean, that little bit? Myra nodded. I asked for a pound of hamburger, and Art put that much on the scale. In fact, not even that much. It said a pound, I saw it. But there was such a little bit that he felt guilty and put some more on. Jim turned away. I'm not hungry anyhow, he said. At ten that night, after they were in bed, a knock sounded on the door. They had been in bed three hours because all they could think of as soon as they had eaten was getting into bed and staying there until the last possible minute on the following morning. But the knock came and Jim went down. He called back upstairs with more life than he'd shown in a long time. Myra, come down. It's Hugh. Hugh's come to see us and Myra came down quickly, something she hadn't done for a long time either. Hugh seemed weary and drawn, but his smile was the same. Hugh hadn't changed a great deal from the gangling kid, who never studied mathematics in school, but always had the answers. It came natural to him. During the coffee that Myra made, Hugh said, Had quite a time getting here. Trains disrupted. All airlines grounded. But I wanted to see you again before... Then there is a war, Jim said. We've been kind of wandering out here. With the censorship, we don't get any news, and the people hereabouts have almost forgotten the bombs, I guess. Hugh stared into his coffee cup for a long time. No, there isn't any war, Hugh grinned wryly. I don't think anybody in the world has got enough energy left to fight one. There was one, then. One that's over? Jim felt suddenly like a fool sitting here on a world that might have gone through a war stretching from pole to pole, and asking if it had happened as though he lived on Mars somewhere, out of touch. But that's the way it was. No, there wasn't any war. You mean our government shot off those bombs themselves? You know, I thought it was funny, landing out in the desert that way like they did. Old Joe would have hit for Chicago or Detroit or New York. It was silly to say bombs dropped on the desert came from an enemy. No, the government didn't fire them. Myra set her cup down. Jim, stop asking Hugh so many questions. He's tired. He's come a long way. The questions can wait. Yes, I guess they can. We'll show you where your room is, Hugh. As she opened the window of the spare bedroom, Myra stood for a moment looking out. Moon's certainly pretty tonight. So big and yellow. Wish I wasn't too tired to enjoy it. They went to bed then, in the quiet home under the big yellow moon over the quiet town. A moon over a quiet country, over a weary, waiting world. Jim didn't go to work the next day. He hadn't planned to stay away from work, but he and Myra awoke very late, and it was then that he made up his mind. For a long time they lay in bed, 
Not even the thought of Hugh being around and all the things they wanted to talk about could bring them out of bed, until they felt guilty about not getting up. Hugh was sitting on the front porch, watching the still trees in the yard. There was a breeze blowing, but it wasn't enough to move the leaves. Every leaf hung straight down, not stirring, and the grass seemed matted and bent toward the earth. Myra got breakfast. She dropped the skillet while transferring the eggs to a platter, but she got her foot out of the way so no harm was done. After breakfast the men went back outside. Jim moved automatically toward a chair. Then he stopped and frowned. He straightened deliberately. He turned and looked at his brother. He said, Hugh, you're a man that knows. What's wrong? What did those bombs do to us? Tell me, I've got to know. Hugh was silent for a time. Then he said, Feel up to a walk? Certainly. Why not? They went to the edge of town and out into a pasture, and stopped finally by a brook where the water flowed sluggishly. After a while, Hugh said, I'm not supposed to tell anybody anything, but somehow it doesn't seem decent, keeping the truth from your own brother. And what difference does it make, really? What's happened, Hugh? There weren't any bombs. No bombs? It happened this way. Long before this earth was formed, a million light-years out in space, a white dwarf died violently. You're talking in riddles. Hugh looked up into the blue sky. A dwarf star, Jim. So incredibly heavy, it would be hard for you to conceive of its weight. This star blew up, broke into five pieces, and the five pieces followed each other through space. The world was formed in the meantime, maybe even this galaxy. We don't know. So the five pieces of heavy star had a rendezvous with a world unborn. The world was born and grew old, and then the rendezvous was kept. Right on schedule. On some schedule so huge and ponderous, we can't even begin to understand it. The five bombs. They hit the earth in a line and drove deep into the ground. But that was only the beginning. It all has to do with magnetism the way they kept right on burrowing toward the centre of our earth, causing the earthquakes, causing apples to fall from trees. Hugh turned to glance at Jim. Did you know you weigh around six hundred pounds now? I haven't weighed myself lately. We checked and found out what the stuff was. We'd never seen anything like it before. That star was a real heavyweight. All the pieces are drawing together toward the centre of earth. But they'll never get there. They won't. We're doomed, Jim. Earth is doomed. That's the why of this censorship. We didn't want panics, mass suicide, a world gone mad. How's it going to come? If allowed to run its course, the world would come to a complete standstill. Nothing would grow. People would move slower and slower until they finally fell in their tracks and could not get up. Eternal night on one side of a dead planet, eternal day on the other. But it's not going to happen? Hugh's mind went off on another track. You know, Jim, I've never been a religious man. In fact, I've only had one concept of God. I believe that God, above all, is a gentleman. Jim said nothing, and after a moment, Hugh went on. Do you know what they do when they execute a man by firing squad? What do they do? After the squad fires its volley, the captain steps up to the fallen man and puts a bullet through his brain. The man is executed for a reason, but the bullet is an act of mercy, the act of a gentleman. We are being executed for a reason we can't understand, and the bullet has already been fired, Jim. Another ten hours, eleven hours. What bullet? Look up there. See it? The moon. Jim looked dully into the sky. It's bigger, a way bigger, hurtling in toward us at ever-increasing speed. When it hits... Jim looked at his brother with complete understanding at last. When it hits, we won't be here any more. That's right. A quick, easy death for the world, from the bullet fired by the last gentleman. They turned back toward the house. Shall I tell Myra? Jim asked. 
What do you think you should do? No, no, we won't tell her. We've got ten hours. Yes, we've got ten hours. Let's go home and have some coffee. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the stories, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more every Monday and Friday. And remember, you can get exclusive monthly novelettes from great authors over on my Patreon. Just a few of those stories include Pillar of Fire by Ray Bradbury, Trouble on Titan by Henry Kuttner, and Omnilingual by H. Beam Piper. You can listen to them and all my videos in ad-free video and audio versions at patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff. But if you'd like to stay on YouTube and enjoy another compilation like this, I recommend my video called Five Deep and Disturbing Sci-Fi Stories. A link to that is on screen now.